Hello, I am Andrew Hipsley, Dean of the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Thank you for joining us for the second part of our series, Perspectives on the Pandemic. This is where we invite experts to share their expertise to help us make sense of a world that has been upended. As we strive to live through the pandemic, we experience a sense of loss, loss of lives and livelihoods, but also loss connected to our very humanity as social creatures. It is the social and human perspectives on the pandemic that we wish to foreground in part two of our series. And it is the experts we look to, to shed their light on these confusing times. Perspectives on the pandemic pulls these experts to center stage to help us make sense of what we feel is under threat. The role of the city in the life of a community the responsibility that a civilized society has to its vulnerable populations, including those in prison. The importance of the arts in the communication between performer and audience and democracy itself. Our second talk in this series invites us to rethink the city and the community for a post pandemic world. I would like to call on Dr. Jody Herzog, who is chair of the Department of Sociology here at Wichita State University to introduce us to today's speaker. Over to you, Jody. Again, uh, Dr. Chase Billingham came to us uh, in 2013 um, from Northwestern University after completing his doctorate in sociology. While he was at Northwestern, he worked for seven years as a research associate in the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy, conducting research on things like housing policy, transportation policy, workforce development, among other subjects. Chase specializes in urban sociology and the sociology of education. His work has been published in some of the top journals in um, those fields, including City and Community, Urban Studies, and Sociology of Education. His research is widely cited in the academic literature, and his work is especially um, influential around the choice of um, school choices and racial segregation. He's gained actually a significant uh, national media attention in outlets like the Atlantic, uh, also Vox and the Boston Globe. Uh, through academic publications and regular commentaries in the Wichita Eagle, Chase pu uh, practices public sociology um, and is highly engaged in ongoing urban policy debates within our community. Uh, his current research looks at how leaders in the public and private sectors in Wichita are dealing with and reacting to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is part of what his talk will be today. So welcome uh, Chase uh, with me and we look forward to his presentation. So thanks for that generous introduction, Jody, and thank you to Dean Hipsley and to Cheryl Miller for putting this series together and for inviting me to participate. And thank you to all of you for being here as well, uh, especially to uh, special guest, my father, Bruce Billingham, who is here on his birthday. Today is his birthday. He doesn't have to be here. Uh, so I really appreciate him spending this time with us today. The best birthday present. Oh, thank you. Now let's mute him, please. <laughs> uh, so let's begin here. What does it mean to be urban? This is a question and a theme that I've investigated a lot in past research. In an article that I published a couple of years ago with my colleague Shelley Kimmelberg, we used survey data to examine how people characterize the places they live in. And we found that labels like urban, suburban, and rural do not map neatly onto territorial boundaries, but rather that people's experience of place, including the characteristics of the built environment, but also their perceptions of the quality of local institutions like schools and public safety, all of that affects how they identify their communities. This speaks to some of the oldest questions in urban sociology. What is the nature of the urban? In what ways is urban life distinct from suburban and rural life? And how are our cities affected by events, social change, and disruption? At the core of sociological thinking about the nature of urbanism is the idea of density. As great sociological thinkers from the German theorists Georg Simmel and Max Weber through the pioneering work of American sociologist Lewis Swerth consistently reiterated, there's something about the coming together of large numbers of people in constant, dense interaction. B 
beyond the impact of the size of the population itself that fundamentally, qualitatively alters the nature of the urban psyche and the character of those interactions, as Zimmel alludes to in this long quotation that I won't read at length to you. The city is much, much more than the sum of its parts, and dynamic density lies at the heart of that sort of urban alchemy. The great American urban critic and analyst Jane Jacobs picked up on this theme as well. As she called it, the intricate sidewalk ballet that takes place each day on city streets, which among other things is also a great force protecting public safety by keeping eyes on the street constantly. It's made possible by that density and heterogeneity that are the quintessential characteristics of urbanism. Density drives urban economies, and it's what allows cities to be hubs of innovation, culture, entertainment, and nightlife. But at this moment, there is immense concern that density is city's worst enemy. As we've seen large events get canceled, social distancing restrictions imposed, and workplaces move entirely remote, many of the things that have made city centers so attractive in the past have been targeted as potential hazards provoking calls for reforms to the built environment, reorganization of things like offices and public transit, and a fundamental reckoning with dense settlement itself. The coronavirus pandemic first emerged in a major city in Wuhan. By mid-February, there were outbreaks in huge global cities like Hong Kong and Singapore. By March, the Lombardy region of Italy surrounding the city of Milan, one of the biggest and densest metro areas in all of Europe, was becoming a global hotspot. And when the virus first made it to the US, some of the first substantial outbreaks appeared in cities like Seattle and New Orleans. And then the virus exploded in New York City. And for weeks and weeks, New York was the hardest hit place on earth. The streets were filled night and day with the sounds of sirens, as well as the sounds of residents cheering from their balconies every night after healthcare workers finished their shifts. Hundreds of thousands of people who were able to left the city altogether. There have now been nearly a quarter million documented deaths in New York City, excuse me, cases in New York City, and about 24,000 documented deaths. More than one out of every eight COVID deaths in the US and about 3% of all deaths across the world have taken place in New York City. There have also been huge numbers of deaths in Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Mexico City, Mumbai, Madrid, in a few other global cities. In Wichita, we've had about 50 deaths. And so much of the talk about the impact of the pandemic in recent months has been about cities. Is there something inherent in the density of urban settlement that has contributed to so much loss of life? Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, who himself comes from New York City, said as much in a Twitter post in March when he wrote, there is a density level in New York City that is destructive. It has to stop and it has to stop now. New York City must develop an immediate plan to reduce density. If you'll forgive my Andrew Cuomo impression. So as we see some people fleeing major urban areas and as we have some public officials making statements about the inherent danger of cities, perhaps this will spell the end of urban density, the end of urban agglomeration, the end of cities. The only evidence that we have to suggest otherwise is basically the entire modern history of the world. This is certainly not the first pandemic to hit the world's cities. And it is true that throughout history, diseases have ravaged cities in large part because overcrowded, unsanitary living conditions have facilitated the spread of diseases. The history of the world is filled with outbreaks of plague, cholera, yellow fever, and other diseases which have killed thousands, often in isolated outbreaks in individual cities, but pandemics have also rolled across multiple cities as well. As my WSU colleague, the historian George Diener explained in an earlier presentation in this series, the influenza pandemic of 1918 hit some cities, especially Philadelphia, terribly hard. About a quarter of the population contracted influenza and thousands, maybe as many as 20,000 died in just that city. But just as cities have suffered from disease, they have also been the places that have led the way in conquering disease. Perhaps the greatest symbolic example of this is the Broad Street Pump in London, 
during a terrible cholera outbreak in 1854. The physician John Snow went through the city interviewing residents about their symptoms and using the data to draw a map of the disease. With his map, he observed that there was a well right at the center of the worst outbreaks from which he concluded that tainted water in that specific well where local residents got their water was causing the disease to spread. When the pump handle was removed, the outbreak began to diminish. This led to innovations in things like boil water orders and improved urban sewage systems that helped to cut down on disease in cities. Similarly, airborne diseases often spread quickly in slum tenements in 19th century cities in the US due to overcrowding and poor ventilation. This was especially true in dense immigrant settlements in places like the Lower East Side of New York. Progressive reforms to housing laws and building codes improved ventilation, reduced crowding, and as a result, brought down rates of disease. These are just a couple of examples. But in general, cities are places of innovation, and they're also the centers of medical research and hospital care. If you are going to get sick, there is no better place to be sick than a modern major city. A lot of things have gone very wrong in the COVID-19 pandemic, and it certainly didn't need to be as bad as it has been including in major cities like New York. But it's important to state also that it could have been much worse. There has never been a time in history when, in general, our cities were better prepared than now to handle this type of pandemic. And cities and countries across the world that have adopted, implemented, and enforced public health best practices for reducing disease spread have been largely successful at limiting transmission, illness, and death. Cities are struggling right now, as are all places, all governments, all people. Cities are struggling largely because most of the things that we do in our cities and enjoy about our cities, dining, entertainment, gathering together, working together, learning together, are out of reach for so many of us. I'm confident that our cities are going to come back. They always have in the past. But when they do, it's possible that some things will be very different and perhaps permanently different. And that's not because of the virus itself, important as it is, but rather because of the various reforms to urban institutions that we as a society have adopted as a means of adapting to the virus. People moving out of cities and into suburbs, working and schooling remotely, shopping online and having their purchases delivered, utilizing social media instead of getting together in person. These are trends that already were well underway, thanks to rapid advances in technology and connectivity. What the COVID experience is likely to do is accelerate those trends that were already underway, perhaps causing some tipping point type phenomena. We're seeing that with residential decisions, certainly with educational trends, and perhaps most importantly in the world of work. Cities are historically hubs of finance, banking, commerce, industry, and retail. They are commuting destinations. And so if we want to understand how cities are going to be reshaped by the pandemic, we should focus first and foremost, I think, on the economy and the workplace. So a lot of what our cities are going to look like in the future is dependent upon what the future of work is going to look like. And here, I think, again, it might be useful to think of this pandemic as an accelerator for trends that were already in the, work, in the works. So we can break it down by various sectors of our workforce, all of whom experience the city in different ways and who are experiencing the pandemic in different ways. We can talk about manufacturing. We can talk about low wage service work. We can talk about the white collar professions. These three groups are likely to be affected in different ways. Let's begin with manufacturing. First, as you know, manufacturing has been declining as a share of employment in the US for decades as a result of the twin trends of offshoring and automation. This, I think, is likely to continue. Along with prisons and nursing homes, many of the biggest hotbeds of disease spread have been meatpacking plants. These are not manufacturing jobs per se. They are not assembly lines, but rather disassembly lines, but they work in the same manner with employees working side by side for long hours in poorly ventilated indoor spaces. Those are perfect conditions for spreading respiratory disease. 
Now, huge cities tend not to be the home of meatpacking facilities like they were at the time that Upton Sinclair was writing The Jungle, but they certainly can be found in many smaller cities in the middle of the country. We've seen over a thousand cases at a pork plant in Sioux Falls, over a thousand cases at a Tyson facility in Waterloo, Iowa, 500 cases at a meatpacking plant in St. Joseph, Missouri, 400 cases at a meatpacking plant in Green Bay, and over 100 cases at a meatpacking plant in Emporia, just an hour from here. These are not gigantic cities, but for their regions, they are urban centers and they are decidedly urban. Manufacturing facilities with assembly lines have similar issues. And despite the economic shifts that cities have undergone over the past half century, large manufacturing facilities still are often located in big cities. And we've seen big outbreaks there. Hundreds of cases at ship shipbuilding facilities in Newport News, Virginia. Hundreds of cases at the Aspen Paper Factory in Kansas City, Missouri. When these facilities have an outbreak, they have to shut down, which cuts into those firms' profits and economic viability and disrupts the supply chain more broadly, including potentially the nation's food supply. Now, automation, the introduction of robotics into manufacturing, that's been going on for a long time, largely as a way for firms to reduce labor costs, while also simultaneously undercutting the bargaining position of organized labor, and also to avoid liability issues associated with workplace in injuries. And I think that you'll likely see that continue because of the additional motivation that firms now have of seeking to avoid production shutdowns that emerge from human transmission of disease. That's going to mean a further erosion of the urban manufacturing workforce, more layoffs, more furloughs. What does that mean for Wichita? This city's fortunes have been tied to the aircraft manufacturing industry for decades. The city's economy was already in crisis as its largest employer, Spirod Aerosystems, was laying off thousands in the wake of the 737 MAX disaster. I have not personally heard of any factory-based outbreaks in Wichita, but of course, with the economic shutdown caused by the pandemic, far fewer pe people have been flying and far fewer aircraft and aircraft parts have been ordered. That further deepens the crisis and has led to thousands more layoffs. Once the pandemic is put down, Air travel will likely return to something close to pre-COVID levels eventually, but it's going to take a while for that to translate into a restoration of productivity at the city's aircraft manufacturers. Many smaller shops will likely go under. And I imagine that many of the furloughs that we've seen will become permanent layoffs. In the meantime, I wouldn't be surprised if many major firms use this opportunity to introduce more automation into their production lines that's going to put a huge burden on manufacturing heavy cities like Wichita. And as this table indicates, Wichita is one of the very most dependent cities on manufacturing in the entire country. It's harder to automate and introduce robotics into meatpacking, but trust me, those companies are eagerly looking into it as we speak. So in smaller cities like Dodge City, Kansas, where the meat industry is one of the primary employers, there could be big effects on unemployment down the road there too. Automation is also going to affect low wage service work, in particular at stores and restaurants. Retail and dining are being absolutely clobbered by COVID. But once again, what we're seeing now is probably less a whole new universe and more a continuation of trends that were already ongoing. This is one of the main areas of focus for my colleague in the WSU Sociology Department, Chuck Kober. Grocery stores and drug stores have been implementing self-checkout technology for many years now as a way of reducing labor costs, in a sense, turning their customers into unpaid labor. I personally have always tended to avoid those types of self-checkout lanes, largely in order to support those workers. But in the interest of social distancing, I've got to admit that as a customer, Self-checkout is becoming even more attractive. And even more attractive than that, of course, is simply clicking online and having what you want delivered right to your doorstep that day or the next day. And we've seen the immense growth in Amazon just during this pandemic. So I think that we're likely to see those services expand, which means that more cashiers in brick and mortar retail are likely to lose their jobs. And the impact on restaurants has been even more direct and more severe. 
Over 6 million restaurant workers lost their jobs in the span of a few months earlier this year. Restaurants and bars have been sites of intense conflict during this crisis over issues like mask wearing and social distancing. Eating and drinking, which you cannot do while wearing a mask while indoors, is a recipe, if you'll forgive the pun, for disaster. Restaurants and small retail, boutique retail, were able to sustain their payrolls for a while with federal loan guarantees. But as that money dries up and the federal government fails to act, thousands of restaurants and small retail shops will probably go under. And to the extent that locally owned, especially high-end restaurants and locally owned kind of quirky boutique type retail outlets, to the extent that those are concentrated in cities, the effect on urban economies and urban lifestyles will be immense. I'll come back to food service in just a bit, but let me talk for a little while about white collar professional work. In other words, offices. As is glaringly obvious for all of, this, all of us on this Zoom call right now, the nature of white collar professional work has shifted dramatically. Again, this is a continuation of trends that were already underway advances in connectivity, video conference technology, and workplace policies, all of these have made remote work more possible and more attractive over the past decade. But we've all gotten a crash course in remote working just this year. In this way, as has always been the case, white collar professionals are a privileged group. You can't zoom into your shift disassembling carcasses at the meatpacking plant or sitting behind the wheel of a bus, or sanitizing surfaces at the hospital. But you generally can if you're a corporate lawyer, or an architect, or a social media marketing specialist. And so much of urban economic development strategies and competition between cities and regions over the past quarter century has been built around attracting, appealing to, catering to, and holding onto those white collar workers these are the groups of people, disproportionately white, well-educated, young, culturally liberal people with trendy consumption tastes and substantial disposable income that the highly influential urbanist Richard Florida calls the creative class. And figuring out how to get those people to move to and stay in your city has been among the primary objectives of every urban economic development professional in the country for years. This is often referred to as attracting talent to your city or region. It's one of my biggest pet peeves in the world because urban economic development professionals throw that term around talent to refer, of course, just to this set of creative class employees. There are plenty of highly talented plumbers and manicurists and car mechanics out there, but those people's talents don't count in creative class urbanism. And so an entire industry has emerged around trying to cater to the tastes and the whims of the creative class. And among other things, this has led to a revolution in building and designing urban spaces. We can see it in our homes. If you've ever watched any episode of any show on the HGTV channel, you're probably familiar with the open concept floor plan. The idea of an open floor plan has been very trendy for a couple decades now. And it owes itself largely to an attempt to mimic open industrial loft apartment spaces that creative class workers in gentrifying areas of trendy cities like to live in. Now we mimic it in all types of dwellings. Restaurants too have become more open. High ceilings, hard echoing surface materials, no more muffling carpets or drapes, exposed kitchens, more bar seating and communal tables, a lot less private dining areas and high-backed booths. If you've been to restaurants over the past couple of decades, you've noticed these changes to how restaurants are laid out. Again, this is a motif designed to evoke an urban industrial feel. All of these things, as you may also have noticed if you've been going to restaurants in recent decades, have made our restaurants a lot louder than they used to be, which means groups of people need to speak louder when they're inside, with large groups of people opening their mouths more, projecting the contents of their lungs at everyone else in the facility. 
We've also seen this trend entering the office market too. Open floor plans, communal spaces, taking down walls. All of these developments emerged to try to reflect a chic urban industrial aesthetic, but also to foster collaboration and interaction among creative class workers. All of these design elements are now problematic. It's basically taken as gospel by many mainstream urban economists that the key to urban prosperity, what makes cities succeed, is the agglomeration effects that are facilitated by this type of intensive face-to-face -face contact among talented professional people. Here's the economist Ed Glazer, that is a real picture of him, who along with Richard Florida is probably the most prominent figure in urban social science in the US today. He says, cities are the absence of physical space between people and companies. They are proximity, density, closeness. They enable us to work and play together and their success depends on the demand for physical connection. Well, uh-oh. The pandemic has upended all of that. Restaurants are now widely seen as some of the most dangerous places to be at this moment, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. Hundreds, maybe thousands of restaurants, including trendy spots in gentrifying neighborhoods, are likely to go under without a massive government bailout. And for the time being, at least, the era of the open office floor plan is over. Currently, Occupancy rates in urban office towers in cities across the US are hovering between five and 20%. Some companies are bringing back some of their workforce, staggering work days, reconfiguring floor plans, putting up plexiglass barriers and things like that. But still, most office workers are not commuting downtown. They're still working from home. And while the adjustment has been tough, they're kind of used to it now. And many are finding that they are more productive working from home than they'd expected they would be. So I wouldn't anticipate that there will be a huge rush back to downtown office spaces anytime soon, especially if urban school systems are not opening their doors and parents are finding that they have to stay home with their children for the beginning of another new school year. Will we see a return to downtown office work at the same levels as before the pandemic? Maybe. There are some indicators that suggest that companies are betting on the future of offices. Perhaps most notably, Facebook closed on a deal in August to lease about 700,000 square feet of office space across from the street from, excuse me, across the street from Penn Station in New York City. That brings to 2 million square feet, the amount of Manhattan office they've taken this year. But simultaneously, Facebook executives asserted bluntly that they think that within the decade, half of their workforce will move remote. So I think Facebook and a few other big deals that we've seen recently are the exception rather than the rule. Not everyone likes working remotely and not everyone even in white collar office jobs can work remote. But the long-term effect of the zooming economy on downtown office occupancy rates will almost certainly be non-zero and quite likely significantly negative. In Wichita, We've already seen the cancellation of construction on Jack DeBoer's new Class A office space at the Waterwalk. Curiously, we also saw the announcement of a new three or four story building of Class A office space in Delano. But in the announcement, the developers mentioned that they have no tenant and they're going to go out right now during the pandemic and try to find some tenants while they're planning construction. So it doesn't sound too, too promising. And I wouldn't be too surprised if you find that project being scaled back or unannounced in the coming months. With office vacancies remaining high, you'll likely see major long-term downstream effects as restaurants, bars, and retail lose substantial portions of their clientele. So we should expect more storefront vacancies as well. Now, with improved therapeutics, reduced transmission, and ultimately a vaccine, all of these predictions could prove false. Maybe things will get back to what we considered normal quite quickly. But again, even if just a small portion of the white collar service class, say 10% or 20%, decides that working from home permanently suits them and their employer quite well, it would have major ripple effects on downtown occupancy rates, consumer spending patterns, 
and by consequence, municipal revenues from sales taxes, excise taxes, tolls, parking fees, and in the small number of cities that have these, commuter taxes and congestion taxes. Vacancy rates may remain stubbornly high. This, given the interplay of supply and demand, should bring down costs, especially in very high cost city centers, which could in the long run make those cities more hospitable for working class people, but in the short run, it's going to slow or halt the progress of gentrification in some neighborhoods, making those neighborhoods less attractive to affluent home buyers, renters, and consumers. And that gets us to the issue of population. This is one of the biggest questions that people are asking right now about cities. Are people going to live in them in the future or are they going to flee? Once again, it's all speculative and you'll hear convincing arguments on either side. You've surely read one of the numerous anecdotal articles that have come out about people fleeing New York for their second homes in the Hamptons or the Catskills, or using the pandemic as a final factor, pushing them to finally pull the trigger on a permanent relocation to the suburbs. There was just another one of these articles in the New York Times this past Sunday. Real estate data from the New York metro area show that there has been a substantial outmigration of middle-class families with children out of the city. But New York is and always has been unique in the American system of cities. There is no city like it in terms of size and density. As I've already mentioned, a lot has been made of the issue of density and the transmission of the virus in tightly packed places like subways and buses, busy sidewalks, etc. But I think that link between density and transmission is overstated. If density were the key factor, predicting outbreaks, we would see massive numbers in Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, Seoul, and you just don't see it. Not anywhere near on the scale of New York City. As of right now, Hong Kong, which you'll recall early on was a critical hotspot for the virus, has seen a total of 4,500 cases and 400 deaths, as the data on the right side of the screen indicate. That's a city of seven and a half million people with a population density of about 18,000 per square mile. New York City has had over 230,000 cases and over 23,000 deaths. And it's a similarly sized city, about 8 million people, slightly more dense, about 28,000 per square mile. And the most densely populated borough of New York, Manhattan, has had the smallest proportion of cases and deaths out of all of the city's boroughs, and the smallest absolute number of cases excluding Staten Island. Right now, most of the worst outbreaks in the US are in spread out communities in the South and in the Midwest. The states that are hotspots right now are places like the Dakotas, Iowa, and Kansas. So residential density per se is much less important than physical crowding without proper safety procedures in place. That's what's driving viral spread in prisons, nursing homes, meatpacking plants, and college dorms in urban, suburban, and rural communities alike. Even so, the calamity that New York endured has probably contributed to a generalized fear of cities. And so the idea that city's density was inherently dangerous and to be avoided may end up turning into a self-fulfilling prophecy in New York and a few other big cities. This too is probably a continuation of trends that were already underway. It was already the case that with the exception of a small demographic slice of the population, suburban communities were growing much more rapidly than urban communities were. So I don't see any evidence of that being a major factor in most urban areas, including Wichita. The population density levels in most American cities are just not that high. Most of Wichita is extremely suburban. So it's not likely that Wichita will lose a lot of people directly due to the disease, but could it work the other way around? If affluent professionals are less bound to a place and an office than before, it stands to reason that people decamping from more expensive and more dense cities could choose to settle in smaller, more affordable metros. This has been a major economic development strategy for smaller middle American metros for several years now, as remote work has increased in popularity. 
perhaps most famously, the Tulsa Remote Program, pays people $10,000 to move to Tulsa and live there as a remote worker working at jobs located in other cities. Wichita has tried to mimic that a little bit with its Wichita Promise program connected to WSU Tech, but it's minuscule in comparison. And so I would say in general that Wichita is in real trouble here, not because of the disease itself, as important as that is, but because of the ways that the economic responses to the disease could exacerbate the economic disadvantages that this region was already facing. Its major industry is hemorrhaging jobs and money, and it's failed to diversify the economy, which is a phrase that economic development professionals have been throwing around for half a century, but have never really adequately acted upon. So if the aircraft industry tanks, there isn't much else to pick up the slack. Wichita is unlikely to, unlikely to be a major beneficiary of the remote work trend, because it is still not a very attractive place for a lot of people to move to. Perceptions of Wichita commonly are that it's inaccessible, there's very little to do here, and the only thing more abrasive than the political climate is the actual climate. And as we've just seen in the most recent city council budget process, the hit that municipal revenues in Wichita have taken is leading to slashing of budgets for services that promote quality of life here, including quality of life items that are particularly attractive to the creative class. Parks, arts and culture, social services. They did give a massive boost to police spending, even in the midst of a budget crisis. And it's true that crime rates are high here, which also tends to dissuade people from moving to the region. But the employment dislocations and income losses, combined with cuts to social services, are likely to lead to even higher levels of crime regardless of whatever money the city pours into the police department. Vacancy rates in downtown office buildings have persistently been high, even in the midst of a growing pre-pandemic economy for many years. For the reasons I described above, it's reasonable to assume that office vacancies will continue to rise, further hampering the city's downtown redevelopment efforts. It's just been in the past couple of years that we've seen the number of workers working downtown budge upward slightly we may see that reverse again. So I've taken all this time and I haven't really gotten to the topic that's in the title of the presentation, rethinking the city for a post pandemic future. As I mentioned in, in the past, urban disease outbreaks have frequently led to advances in public health infrastructure. And a lot of the adjustments that are being made right now are in line with that tradition, rethinking office layouts, commuting patterns, ventilation systems, reconfiguring restaurants for outdoor dining. These are useful adjustments to tamp down the virus. But this is the first time we've had a global pandemic in a truly global, service-heavy, connected, technological economy. And also, the pandemic hit at a time of very high and rising economic inequality. The economic shutdown gives us an opportunity to hit the pause button on some of those trends and to rethink our urban public policy priorities. We have this stacked set of crises, ranging from the individual and family level to the organizational, municipal, and societal level. Workers aren't earning, so they're not spending. So businesses and restaurants aren't earning, so they can't pay rent. So they're facing eviction, and landlords aren't earning, so they're having trouble paying tax bills. So municipalities aren't earning, so they're cutting back on services. We need to intervene somewhere even more heavily in that liquidity crunch. In the short term, that means extending expanded unemployment benefits and distributing more relief payments to families, extended paycheck protection programs for employers, moratoria on evictions and foreclosures for renters and homeowners, and economic support for small landlords. As I wrote in the column in the Wichita Eagle in May, cities and states need an infusion of cash from the federal government right now. They actually needed it in April and May, and it never came. Cities are short on cash, but they still have to do the things that they do. As just one example of this, with far fewer people commuting to work than before the pandemic, ridership on urban public transit systems has plummeted in recent months. You may have noticed buses driving through Wichita nearly empty. In some ways, it might be reasonable to expect that that would be a useful place for cities to save money. 
by cutting transit that people are using less frequently. But those people that are reverently referred to as essential workers, grocery store workers, janitors, Amazon warehouse workers, just to name a few, they still have to get to work. And the jobs they hold are often low paying, keeping private car ownership out of reach. Keeping those buses running on a regular schedule and deliberately reducing capacity to allow for social distancing to help keep those riders and the drivers safe is imperative at this moment. And Wichita's leaders are to be commended for keeping those buses running even in the midst of the budget crisis. Cities got some support from the CARES Act to help support uh, COVID accommodations um, for public transit, but that money too is going to uh, dry up pretty soon. Public transit has never been a profitable enterprise. And these days, public transit is draining more money than ever. But cutting service now, when those who need transit still really absolutely need reliable service, would do great harm to urban economies. The money for these transit systems is going to have to come for, from somewhere. It certainly isn't going to come from fares. And so this is just one place among many where stepped up federal financial support is badly needed. Without it, not only will quality of life for regular people in cities decline as libraries close, roads go unpaved, and park maintenance ceases, but the tools that cities use for economic development, including financial incentives for companies and talent retention programs, will dry up. In the long run, that could very well exacerbate the inequality between cities that already exists. And cities that have struggled in their economic developments over the past a uh, few decades, cities that have come out on the losing end of that intercity competition, cities like Wichita, could very well fall even further behind. This can create a sort of vicious circle where declining economic activity and population feeds on itself as city services decline and quality of life suffers in a series of ripples extending from that initial economic shock. This was a process that was clearly illustrated four decades ago by Barry Bluestone and Bennett Harrison in their classic book, The Deindustrialization of America. And it's still a very real potential right now for this region, as well as many other cities in the country. Over the long term, then, the changes to work that we're seeing will have to trigger policy reforms. Most important of all, if even more people are displaced from jobs due to automation, we'll need to have a serious national conversation about the link between work and income and even more urgently about the link between work and health insurance. We'll likely see an increased push for some sort of universal basic income program and for single payer healthcare. As the long running expectation that we tie our livelihood and our healthcare to stable employment becomes increasingly unsustainable, untenable for a larger proportion of the population. When it comes to cities, if the remote work trend proceeds and we see an elevated level of office and retail vacancies, this is gonna pose a major challenge to cities, but it could give us an opportunity to rethink our building and development priorities. That vacant property, likely with reduced property values, reduced asking prices, reduced rents, could be converted into housing, especially affordable housing. We're seeing an early example of this at the 125 North Market building in downtown Wichita, where it was just announced that that uh, tall office tower will be converted into new apartments. This is gonna be especially important in cities with runaway costs like New York, San Francisco, and Boston, where high construction costs, zoning regulations, and other obstacles have combined to keep residential vacancy rates low, constraining supply, and causing housing costs to skyrocket. In high cost metros, the solution is, and always has been, to increase supply dramatically. For many of the reasons I've already mentioned, the pandemic may well lead to making those cities more affordable. And it could provoke policy changes to things like zoning regulations, which could make it easier to build more. In cities like Wichita, unaffordability is not the crisis that it is in those places. Still, we struggle here to support homeless and housing insecure people. And if the long run economic downturn is severe here, we will likely see large numbers of evictions and foreclosures, and we could have a very different type of housing crisis on our hands. So policymakers should be thinking about what we're building, for whom, and at what price point. Cities are gonna to need to rework their spending priorities. For years, 
cities have been, have been investing huge sums of money on economic development projects built around the idea of people coming together, attracting tourists and conventions, and appealing to the consumption tastes of the professional classes. Think about some of the highest profile developments in Wichita in recent years. Intrust Bank Arena, the rebuilt Nafsker Park, the new baseball stadium. These and many others have been largely about creating new spaces for people to congregate, to hold mass gatherings. It's still not clear when we'll be able to do that again, to come together in big groups. And so as we face the potential for a prolonged economic downturn, substantial economic hardship, declining municipal revenues, it's remarkable to me that public and private sector leaders appear to be moving forward with their ambitious riverfront legacy master plan, which will commit over a billion dollars to tearing down Century Two to build new spaces for conventions, performing arts, and new office space. This is a moment when we can be rethinking our cities to make them more about people and less about profits. But that's a choice that we have to actively make by putting pressure on our elected leaders. So for now, I'll leave it there. I'll give everyone else the opportunity to offer any questions or comments they may have, but just uh, wanna thank you all again for giving me the chance to speak to you today. Thank you very much, Chase. And as uh, that was very informative and as someone who has spent a, a large part of my life in Wichita, some of the things you had to say about the city was, was very interesting. So thank you for your presentation. We have a number of questions in the chat that I'm gonna call on first, and then we'll open it to more questions. Chase, if you are ready. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the first question is from Maria. I'm curious how you think changes in remote working and schooling might influence the spread of broadband internet access to more rural areas. I have been wondering how people who don't have internet access at home are disproportionately harmed by schools and offices closing. It's a great question. And I think that there will be important impacts here, but just as there is immense heterogeneity in cities. There's also immense heterogeneity in rural areas too. There are very, very, very poor pockets um, of rural America that are poorly served by broadband and other infrastructure uh, components. But rural America also includes some very, very wealthy resort communities that are quite well served, just as well served, if not better, um, by infrastructure like broadband um, as major cities are. And so to the extent that people are going to be relocating from cities, if that happens as a result of the pandemic, I think it's more likely that you're going to see them going to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, or Aspen, and less likely that they're going to be going to, um, to Western Kansas, to places that, that have been um, consistently underserved by those types of infrastructure. So hopefully we could see some um, a political coalition emerging to try to use that moment if we do see a move from cities to suburbs to try to improve infrastructure access for those uh, less served, underserved, lower income rural communities. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if that's going to happen if those who are relocating tend to be the affluent who are moving to communities that are already well served by those things. Okay. Thank you, Chase. A uh, question from Jane. Will the suburbs continue to justify more taxpayer paid transportation exp uh, expansions? Will the high cost of more and bigger freeways arterials be justified in the next 10 to 40 years, or should there be more investments in neighborhoods, especially for the creative class? Well, um, if you're asking for my personal opinion, I think that, that the latter is the more appropriate policy response, that we should be seeing uh, more investment, not necessarily in neighborhoods, gentrifying neighborhoods for the creative class, but particularly in neighborhoods that house the poor uh, and lower income people in cities. But yes, I mean, sprawl has been um, a notoriously difficult problem in cities for many years. Uh, suburban sprawl and the way that it was facilitated by highway construction, along with housing policies, public school, as well as uh, racial and ethnic animosities, um, is, uh, has done great harm to inner city communities over the past half century. But the bigger issue when it comes to thinking about that, I think, is going to be the climate issue. And uh, one person that I would love to ask this question to is Russell Fox, who I see here, who uh, studies urban communities as well uh, from a sustainability perspective. And I think that he has some of his students here 
as well because that specific question, the question about what we build and where, is going to become even more imperative as climate change becomes even more of a threat to our communities, both urban and rural, over the coming decades. Thank you. Neil Allen has a question. What are one or two ways that a university like Wichita State could, could do to counteract these negative effects of the pandemic if they have resources dedicated to urban revitalization? Well, I think it's an important question. And I think that from what I've heard from our new president, Jay Golden, I think that that is a priority of his. And in a presentation that he gave to the faculty senate yesterday, he was talking about some of the ways that the university is going to become or already is becoming a leader in uh, addressing the, the health issues related to the pandemic, but also thinking about diversifying the economy. What we've seen is that that's a, a term that we've heard quite a bit that we need to um, not put all our eggs in one basket. We don't need to rely so heavily on the aircraft industry. That's been said for many decades now. But we have struggled as a region to figure out what is that alternative. Wichita State has played an important role in that in the past, but I think that it seems that uh, President Golden really seems to understand how imperative it is at this moment. So um, utilizing strategically um, that innovation campus in particular is going to be important for us to think about how do we bring in uh, new types of jobs that are going to be good paying jobs for the people that hold them, but are also going to have an impact on the community beyond the university, in particular, raising the standard of living for everyone, not just those who are served by the innovation campus. Great. Uh, question from Charles Talbot. As a sociologist, can you speak to the wisdom of the policy decision to lock down the economy and the resulting social collateral damage? Well, it's a very fraught question. It's a very difficult question to answer. And it's been very controversial in Wichita, including and in many other regions. Uh, I generally am in favor of most of the uh, policies that have been put in place regarding social distancing and mask wearing and shutting down places where transmission of virus uh, is um, quite uh, rapid and, and intense, places like restaurants and bars. But of course, there are victims of those types of policies as well, and people whose livelihoods um, are being really adversely affected by that. And so that's where uh, federal support really needs to come in to keep those people going. And we had the Paycheck Protection Program initially early in this virus, uh, but that has dried up now. We've seen that stimulus for families dry up, and we never got that support for uh, cities and states from the federal government. So we're going to need another round of that if we're going to uh, continue with the types of safety protocols that we put in place. The alternative is not really much better. I mean, what we've seen in the Wichita Eagle today, it was reported that Exploration Place just revealed that their attendance has been down, I think, 75% year over year. They are, I think, a million dollars in debt. And they've been open. They've been open, they've been open at reduced capacity, but even at their reduced capacity, people aren't coming to the museum. And so simply reopening everything is not going to be the magic bullet that's going to solve the economic problems brought on by the disease. It's true that some of the restrictions that were put into place to try to tamp down the virus have been difficult on uh, businesses, but the, the counterfactual, where businesses were just allowed to open whenever they want to, doesn't necessarily imply that customers are gonna come to those businesses. Customers, consumers are going to make choices based upon what they feel is safe. And for many of them, that's not going out to places where they think that uh, they're at risk. So in general, I'm supportive of those types of restrictions uh, and hopefully public policy, uh, public policy makers and elected officials are, are being thoughtful and trying to weigh the public health needs against the, the needs of the economy. Thank you, Chase. We have several more questions in the chat. Um, this one is part comment, part question from Russell Hawks. Uh -huh. Chase, a city that would focus more on people that profits seems to me to be a city that would be primarily concerned with sustainability, that is providing the key low level resources which the majority of human beings need to get around to live and work, 
rather than growth, since, as you know, the sorts, sorts of investments which are assumed to be necessary to attract the growth generating creative class are very costly. And it is wealthy actors who are mostly capable of both providing and benefiting from such upfront costs. Do you have some general thoughts about political changes which move a city towards a sustainability model and away from a growth model, especially given the growth which much of our tax base depends on? That is a, a quintessential Russell Fox paragraph, and I'm very impressed that he was able to write that in the span of just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, I do have some thoughts on that. I'd actually be interested to hear uh, his thoughts on that. But one thing I, I can say is that the competition that cities and regions feel they need to engage in against one another is very real. They're not making it up, but it's very detrimental because what it does is it pits cities against one another in terms of what they can give away, largely with public resources. And so we see uh, that in order to try to attract jobs, which can often be fleeting, we see cities giving huge tax breaks to potential employers, et cetera. All of these things act as a drain on potential municipal resources. And so there's gotta be some sort of detente. Cities have got to figure out a way to collaborate, to cooperate rather than to be competing with one another at all times. I don't know exactly what that would involve, but there has to be some sort of um, summit of, of mayors or of city and county leaders that, that tries to cool down that sort of undercutting one another. We also see it with, from the company side as well, where companies actively pit cities against one another in these sort of uh, faux um, uh, public competitions about where are we gonna locate our new headquarters? I think it's really detrimental to communities. So there's much more that I would say in response to Russell's question, but I think that that's one place that we might wanna think about starting is let's cut down on the interurban competition. We're getting close to time, but there are two, so these last two questions will be it for today. Uh, the first question is from David Eichhorn. Could you elaborate on your mention of climate change and how that might dovetail with the pandemic in defining population redistribution, especially given that cities are largely situated on coasts and other bodies of water, which will be subject to rising water levels? It's a great question and it's, it's really not my area of expertise, but it's going to be the ultimate challenge for 21st century cities. And it's going to be much more challenging, not just for cities in the United States or the Western world, but especially cities that are built right on the coast, gigantic cities in the developing world. We're going to see massive waves of migration. And so one place where we're going to need to be thinking about that is how does that affect federal immigration policy in the United States? Uh, we're, we're likely to see waves of people that are going to need to, for humanitarian reasons, relocate. And it's my hope that, that this country um, can, can be welcoming there. And a region like Wichita, which has seen so much domestic, net domestic out migration, or what people often call brain drain, of young people who grew up in Kansas. We've been losing those people. The population of Wichita has been growing much more slowly than most of our peer cities much more slowly. It, among all of the 100 metro areas in the United States, Wichita is in the bottom quartile in terms of population growth over the past decade. It seems to me that, that builders and economic development proponents are projecting that that's going to continue in the, in the future. If you look at housing permits, uh, year to date this year for housing permits, there have been about 600 pulled in Wichita. In Tulsa, it's about six times as high. In Omaha, Fayetteville, Little Rock, um, four to six times as many building permits being issued in those communities. In Dallas, it's about 50 times as high. So it doesn't look like people are expecting Wichita to grow much. Um, international migration is a place where we can uh, fill in that gap. And I think that that's part of President Golden's uh, thinking as well for thinking about how we're going to utilize the resources of Wichita State to help to uh, bring more population and more uh, innovation to this region. So I don't know if I directly answered David's question there, but, but when I think of climate change and cities, what I'm thinking first and foremost about is, is uh, migration. But we also need to talk about mitigation strategies, and we also need to talk about what that's going to mean for wealthy cities in the U.S., Miami, New York, Boston, New Orleans. They are all very much at threat of being underwater within a century, and they're going to need plans, and it's going to cost trillions of dollars. Chase? The last question is from Jody Herzog. 
you mentioned changes in the housing market. It seems that housing is becoming more stratified in Wichita with a decline in new housing options for the middle class as the cost of building materials have increased. What are some of the implications you see for our community in regards to effects on the wealth gaps? Well, I've been thinking about that a lot, and I think that Jody's right. Um, and that, that goes to something that I was just mentioning, which is that it doesn't seem like we're building that much new housing in Wichita. Now, Wichita doesn't have that massive affordability problem that a place like San Francisco does where they need to build much more in order to stabilize housing prices uh, in the aggregate. But you're right that there is not that much supply right now. If you look at um, months supply in the housing market, it's going down. If, you, if you've been looking for a house recently, you might notice that they're getting snatched up quite quickly. And so there isn't that much supply, particularly in that middle income market. So I don't know if that's specifically about uh, building material costs or if it's about uh, zoning or just about the attitudes of, of builders right now and profitability. But I think it's a really important problem and it's going to be a problem if Wichita State and the economic development professionals in this region want to attract those middle income professional workers. They have to have good houses to live in at reasonable prices. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much, Chase, for your time today and for spending time with us as a community uh, faculty part of our series. Now, this is Brianna Bocre from Criminal Justice. She'll be talking about the impacts of COVID-19 on incarcerated people and their families. So we hope that you can join us again next week uh, for information about Bree's program and Zoom, how to join. Just go to uh, www.wichita.edu slash PAN2. That's the number two. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Dean Hipsley. And thank you to Dr. Herzog as well.